Enga mana, enga reo, ro rakatitama, tenakoto, tenakoto, tenatato, katoa, norera, ko waio, ko harleen hain, tako ingawa, ko te tumuaki o te fariwanaka o atako aho, nami hinui kiakoto, norera, tenakoto, tenakoto, tenatato, katoa. Good evening, everyone. My name is Harleen Hain, and I have the great privilege of being the Vice Chancellor here at the University of Otago. And it is my special pleasure to welcome you to this inaugural professorial lecture for Professor Sheila Skeef. Now, as you know, these lectures are a time of great celebration for the university, and I'm so happy to see so many people here to mark this really important point in Sheila's career. On behalf of the university, I would like to extend a particularly warm welcome to members of Sheila's family who have joined us this evening. Um, Her mother is currently in Canada, um, and we're hopeful that she will either be watching us online live this evening or potentially watching us delayed um, in the future. But I note that her mother-in-law is in the audience, um, as well as her husband, Emeritus Professor Murray Scaife. Murray, it's fantastic to have you here. And their three daughters are here as well, Laura, Carmel, and Alicia. Now, the presence of family members at these IPLs is such a clear signal of their importance. So it is fantastic to have all of you here. Now, in addition to these special guests who are seated um, near the front, um, as I look out on the audience this evening, I see staff and students um, from throughout the university, as well as members of the wider Dunedin community, who continue to use these IPLs as a part of their ongoing education. So to everyone who is here tonight, no my, haramai, welcome. Now, the other thing that I often say at the beginning of these inaugural professorial lectures is that the path to professor at the University of Otago is not necessarily an easy one. In order to be successful, an applicant for the rank of professor must demonstrate excellence in teaching, in research, and in service to the university and the wider community. Now, as you will undoubtedly learn through her lecture this evening, Professor Skeef is an award-winning teacher, and she's an outstanding researcher. She has also provided exceptional service to the department, to the university, and to the wider research community. So, Sheila, on behalf of the University of Otago, I would like to warmly congratulate you on your very well-earned promotion to professor. I will now call on the PVC of Sciences, Professor Richard Barker, who will tell us just a little bit more about Sheila's path to Professor. Norera, Tanakoto, Tanakoto, Tanatato, Katoa. Vice Chancellor Tenakwe, Deputy Vice Chancellors Tenakoto, Professor Skeef, Tenakwe. Emeritus Professor Ski Tenakwe, Associate Professor Murray Tenakwe, friends and colleagues, Tenakoto, 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 Katoa. It is my pleasure to introduce our speaker tonight, Professor Sheila Skeef, to give her inaugural professorial lecture at the University of Otago. As indicated by our Vice Chancellor, Professor Skeef is one of our newer professors at the University of Otago, uh, having received a well deserved promotion to the position in February of this year. Professor Skeef was born in Canada, in northern Ontario, in fact, in a town called Sudbury. A reliable source, it was Sheila actually, tells me it was the nickel nickel capital of the world at the time. Not sure what to do when she left school, but knowing she liked science, which was a good choice, she enrolled at the University of Guelph, which is known for its science program. It was there in the company of influential peers, this included Murray, Sheila discovered a love for nutrition. Professor Skeef graduated BSc Honours from the University of Guelph in 1984 and then worked in the Department of Nutrition Sciences at that university, firstly as a technician and then as a teaching fellow, during which time she completed her master's degree. It was our good fortune that saw Professor Skeef join the University of Otago in 1989 as a member of our Department of Human Nutrition, starting as a half-time assistant lecturer before being promoted to lecturer in 1997, then senior lecturer in 2006, 
going to full-time in 2008, promoted to associate professor in 2014, and finally professor this year. So worked through the full spectrum of academic appointments, which is quite remarkable. While employed as a lecturer, Professor Skeef found time to complete her PhD, graduating in 2004, and during this she looked at the iodine status of vulnerable populations, uh, infants, pregnant women, those who are nutritionally stressed, and we'll hear a bit more about that later. With 10 book chapters and around 60 fully peer-reviewed publications, Professor Skeef is a productive researcher. And in reading through her CV, I was struck by how well connected she is across the universities. And I saw uh, publications that were jointly authored by uh, people from most of the departments in the Division of Sciences and, and Health Sciences. Her research focuses on iodine and in particular the consequences of a low level of uh, iodine prevalent in the New Zealand diet. And her research into iodine deficiency led to iodine fortification in bread. So we all get our iodine thanks to Sheila's work. With this expertise, Professor Skeef is sought after as an advisor to government and other bodies, both in New Zealand and Australia and elsewhere. She is the longest serving member of the New Zealand Nutrition Society and has been an expert advisor for several nutrition, uh, national nutrition surveys. As alluded to by the Vice-Chancellor, Professor Skeef is recognised for her outstanding commitment as a teacher, both in the classroom and as a postgraduate supervisor. She has supervised more than 50 masters or PhD students and has also found the time to supervise a number of French exchange students. She is an award winner. In 2009, she was the OUSA uh, recipient of a Top 10 Supervisor Award. In 2015, an OUSA Top 10 Teacher Award. In 2016, was on the long list for Best Teacher. In, uh, in 2018, she won a University of Otago Excellence in Teaching Award, followed in 2018 by a New Zealand Tertiary Teaching Excellence Award, an award of the highest significance. Tonight, we're going to hear about her work on iodine deficiency that spans more than two de decades, as well as her thoughts on food literacy and its role in the health of our people and our planet. Please join me in welcoming Professor Sheila Skeef. I've got some props here, and I see that somebody, oh, there's a lot of people. There we are. Thank you, Anne Louise. Somebody has brought some of the other props that I was looking for in the last minute before I came along. I've also brought my goiter. Um, I've got the pink Himalayan salt and the iodized salt and all the bits and pieces that I tend to have. I usually start my lectures by just looking around, usually for students to see who I can see to pick on um, <laughs> and ask names. So I see a lot of people here. Um, and I can't, I, it would take me so long to look. But thank you. I can see all of you here. And I'm really, really, very grateful that I really only, only hope that the first three rows were finished, were filled up. So I am going to start my lecture. Um, I thought I should start with just a little image that shows the globe. I know that you know from Richard's talk that I was born in Canada um, and that we traveled here in 1988 and I began teaching at the University of Otago part-time in 1989. Thank you very much to Professor Mann for employing me at that time. I've put a couple of key dates here which are important just so that you have an idea of what's happening in that kind of journey. So 1996, when I began my PhD, 2004, when I finally finished it. Um, 2009 is an important date uh, with regard to my iodine research, and then 2019. And what I want you to note is that there is a little green, it's purposely green, that comes off somewhere kind of around 2011, 2012. So when you're preparing one of these lectures, you kind of think about all the people um, that have kind of helped, whoops, all the people that have helped you over the years. And um, thinking back to how it all started and, you know, the journey and the whole process and where it's ended up. 
And one of the things, of course, is that we always think about our parents. And you mentioned my mother, who, who can't be here and who, I won't say anything more about watching the lecture, but I think it's very unlikely. <laughs> um, and my father, who died um, so many years ago. But I think uh, it's important, maybe I'm going to try and start with a pepiha, because Marie and I have been doing a Tikongo course, and I saw Peter somewhere, too. Where is Peter? Oh, there you are. And he's in our Tikonga course, so I feel even more ob obligated um, to do that. So please um, bear with me. Um, Kor Carmel Te Monga, Kor Huron Te Moana, Kor Baha'i Te Iwi, Kor Jeffrey Toko Papa, Kor Nell Toko Mama, Kor Murray Toko Hoa Rangatira. Ko Laura, Rato, Ko Carmel, Ko Alicia, Oku uh, Tamariki, Ko Gabriel, Taku Mokupuna, Ko Skeef, Toku Fano, Ko Sheila, Toku Ingawa, Norera, Tenakoto, Tenakoto, Tenara Toto, Katoa. <laughs> Getting there. So, the title of my talk is Balancing Food Fact and Fiction. And so, of course, it's going to have some nutritional um, themes in it. And I thought, how am I going to kind of introduce the talk and move into my area of research, which is iodine? So I'm going to kind of give a little bit of um, beginning, and then we'll move into iodine, and then we'll move out. So I thought, let's talk about the choices that people make when they get up in the morning. Uh, what do they have for breakfast? What do you decide to have for breakfast? Well, when I was in Canada growing up, it was very common for people to have uh, cereal. I mean, that's common in New Zealand, but it's particularly common in New Zealand. It's a very um, usual breakfast. And Cheerios was one of my favorites. So there we have Cheerios in a, in a bowl with some milk. But is that the breakfast I eat now? Well, it's not. The breakfast I eat now, as my family knows, is quite different. Okay, this is the breakfast I eat now, an egg, some mushrooms, some tomatoes, a bit of rocket on a piece of bread. Okay, that's my breakfast. I've been eating that breakfast for the last 12 years. I know it's a long time. <laughs> um, yes. Um, and so why if, what's, what's, what's caused the change? Why do we choose the foods that we eat to eat? When we make a simple decision just about having breakfast. I mean, obviously, it's partly travel. Um, it could be, there's all sorts of things that, that influence our choice. Uh, could be cost, could be taste, could be our culture, could be our environment. There's a variety of different things that haven't influenced that. Um, but of course, we are also influenced by lots of things around us, our own knowledge. Um, and hopefully, as health professionals, okay, and I work in the Department of Human Nutrition, we're also, also influenced by nutrition and food guidelines. And I look at some of the colleagues that are here in the department, and I know they've put a huge amount of time here in the room, looking a huge amount of time into coming up with food and nutrition guidelines. So New Zealand has a set of eating and activity guidelines, uh, which are produced by the Ministry of Health, and which came out in 2015 in a revised version. And these eating and activity guidelines have a series of eating statements, activity statements, as well as a body weight statement. And I didn't, I initially had all the eating statements up, but I don't think you probably want to, to read through them with me. And I think this particular schematic, which is produced by the New Zealand Heart Foundation, sort of really summarizes those eating statements. Eat most vegetables and fruit, and vegetables are on top of um, the fruit because we want you to eat more vegetables than fruit. Eat some grain foods and starchy vegetables. Then we've got legumes, fish, seafood, and then meats at the end. So those words are actually placed in that order for a particular reason, okay? Milk, yogurt, and cheese, and then our healthy oils, nuts, and seeds. So that looks fairly straightforward. Canada, of course, has come up, I thought I'd better allude to Canada a little bit, has come up with a, a new revised a set of food guidelines. And they've got this in this plate shape, which makes it a little bit easier for people to visualize. And again, you all, probably most of you know this, eat a variety of healthy foods a day. Um, half of your plate should be vegetables and fruits, and the fruits are small. We've got a quarter of the plate, which are our protein foods. You can see there's not much meat there. Uh, make water your drink of choice, and then choose whole grain foods, okay? And you can see on that plate, there's not a lot of white food. Not that that's necessarily a terrible thing, 
but uh, that is interesting just to think about that. The other thing that the Canadians do, did this year is they, they took dairy products out as a food group. Okay, so they made a change that way, so just to be aware of that. Now, this is all about eating healthy foods and a healthy diet, but what about the planet? So I'm sure many people are aware that this document came out, it's called Food Planet Health, and this was produced by the Eat Lancet Commission, and this is about a healthy diet that's also been developed by, and is linked to sustainable food systems. So it's a healthy diet and a healthy planet, so they go together. And since the kind of these kind of guidelines and this report was launched earlier this year, there is repeated news items that are on um, coming up all the time because that's part of my lectures. I try to have kind of news clips that have been coming on um, that show or suggest that we should be reducing the amount of meat and dairy products in um, the New Zealand diet or in all diets across the world. This, the guidelines are very similar. <laughs> Now, of course, whenever nutrition information comes out like this and these reports come out, we always have to hear the other side, don't we? We do. We hear the other side. So yesterday when I went to the supermarket, a lot of things happened yesterday in the supermarket. I found these two magazines. And of course, they both have nutrition. Often we see these nutrition things. So I'm going to show you. I bought them, but I didn't need to because I could have gone online. Um, <laughs> I will send the bill. Uh, so, this is the recent one, Inside North and South, new issue in defense of meat and dairy. So, of course, we're going to have the reverse, so the in defense of meat and dairy. And then the listener is maybe more of a kind of psychology, latest science on how to beat your brain's reaction to fat and sugar. Okay, so when we're deciding on the foods we can eat, we're also influenced, obviously, by what's in the local media uh, and kind of um, magazines and things like that. However, a lot of people actually don't look at any of that. They go onto the web, and they look on the web, and they just Google things on Google. Um, and if you were looking at salt, okay, and you can see how this is going to move on. If you're looking at salt and you Google that, you might come up with a website, okay? And this is an example of one, and I just Googled that, and it's about different types of salt. So why is salt important? It's a really simple choice that we make every day. Uh, about what kind of salt we might or might not put on our food. So if I have my um, breakfast, here's my breakfast, could I put the pink Himalayan trendy sea salt on there? Or should it be this iodized, white iodized salt, kind of the boring stuff? Which choice should I make and does it matter? Now every single student I've ever taught will know, okay, about this kind of salt, okay? Because we talk a lot about um, whether we should use this salt or this salt. Saying that, I don't put either of those salts on my, uh, on, <laughs> on my um, breakfast because I put my spicy uh, Cholula, which is salty enough, okay, sauce, which is from Mexico. So don't worry, I'm still putting sodium on there. Okay, so why does it matter what choice we make about the type of salt, okay? Well, that's because this salt our white salt, has iodine in it. And this salt, this pink Himalayan salt, really doesn't have any iodine in it, okay? And that's important from a New Zealand context because iodine is an essential micronutrient that is found in the soils in New Zealand, that is found in our foods that we need, um, that the body needs. And we need iodine in very small amounts to make something called thyroid hormones. I'm not going to get into a big discussion about what thyroid hormones do, but they're very important. Um, one of the key functions they do is they maintain the body's metabolic rate, and they're also needed for normal growth and development, particularly for the brain. Okay, so just keep those in mind. So what happens when you get too little iodine? Well, you develop goiter. A lot of people know that if you don't get enough iodine in your diet, you'll get a goiter. Okay, and if for those of people who are quite young in the audience, okay, if you don't know that much about goiter, if you ask a grandparent or a great-grandparent, uh, they'll tell you about goiter, particularly if they grew up in New Zealand. And what is a goiter? Well, a goiter is an enlargement of the thyroid gland. Okay, so when you don't get enough iodine in your, in your diet, the thyroid gland picks that up and decides that it is going to become a, a much more efficient organ at capturing the amount of iodine that comes into the diet, okay, and it gets a little bit larger and it enlarges, okay, and so also make sure that there's enough thyroid hormones that get into the blood, okay, so we get this enlargement at the base of the neck, okay. 
But there's a lot of other things that happen as well, not just goiter. So there's a range of consequences. And the term that is used to describe the range of consequences is something called iodine deficiency disorders, or IDD. Now this term was first described by Professor Basil Hetzel. And this is a great picture of Basil with Christine Thompson. Uh, he came to visit our Department of Human Nutrition, and you can see that Christine uh, was also, and Christine, unfortunately, I don't think she's here. She said she's got very, very bad back, so she's literally flat on her back. Um, and so she wasn't able to come. But she's done a lot of work, of course, in trace elements in New Zealand, particularly on selenium and iodine. And Professor Hetzel has done he did some key studies looking at iodine. He was from Adelaide. He's died about four or five years ago. Um, but he did some studies in Papua New Guinea looking at iodine in pregnant women. And so he coined the term iodine deficiency disorders because people are always just thinking about goiter. So what I want to describe to you with regard to iodine is that you have increasing levels of severity with iodine. You can have mild iodine deficiency, moderate, and severe iodine deficiency. Okay, and a series of things happen as we go from mild to moderate to severe, so as we get less and less iodine in the diet. The number of people who have a goiter increases. Okay, so maybe in mild iodine deficiency, there might be 5 or 10%, but as we become more severe, that kind of goes up to maybe 20, 30, 40% of the population. Another thing that happens is, remember I said that iodine was very important for brain development? We get some impaired motor and uh, mental abilities are affected. And then eventually, when you get quite low, so moderate to severe iodine deficiency, you get what's called hypothyroidism. So this is when your thyroid hormones drop below kind of the normal range. Now, one thing I just want to point out is because you don't get changes in your blood, okay, until sort of later on, we have to use other ways of working out um, iodine status and um, whether people are getting enough iodine. Now, if a woman, okay, is living in an area with very low amounts of iodine in the diet, okay, uh, and so she's got severe iodine deficiency, it doesn't happen to every, and she gets pregnant, it doesn't happen to every pregnant woman, she may have a baby who is a cretin. Okay, and so here is a picture. I can see, I can see, I can see Kirsten there. They've seen all these pictures. These are some of the lectures that I give. So here's a picture of four brothers, okay? The two brothers in the middle, okay, are both cretins, and the two brothers on either side are not cretins. And the difference between the brothers is that their mother was obviously very severely iodine deficient uh, when she was pregnant and gave birth to these uh, cretins. And cretins have very low IQ, about 30. Okay, they're often stunted. Um, they may be deaf mute. They may have a squint. Okay, and these are all irreversible symptoms. And then their mother was given a bolus dose, a big dose of iodine, uh, again, when she was pregnant before she had these two other brothers, and they're perfectly fine. Okay, so that just shows you that the, the dramatic effect of one simple nutrient that can have on health, particularly during pregnancy. The other good thing about this uh, picture is you can see that these uh, four brothers are standing in front of a pile of pink Himalayan salt. <laughs> yeah, so it's kind of all kind of comes together. Okay, so what about New Zealand? Now, I've got this picture here of this Maori woman. Uh, with a very large goiter. And I do have to say that we don't know for 100% whether this woman has a goiter um, because of iodine deficiency or not, because other things can cause a goiter. And I've got the endocrinologist, I can see Professor Mann over there looking at me. Um, but other things can cause goiter than just iodine deficiency. And in looking at the diets, uh, particularly the diets of Māori people kind of more in this region, I would be suspicious to think that they would actually develop goiters a lot. And maybe this woman lived quite inland, okay? Maybe up in the North Island, I'm not sure. But it does sort of show you that historically we've had problems with iodine and iodine deficiency in New Zealand. And that's because New Zealand is sort of unique, but not. This happens in lots of other parts of the world. We have low levels of many trace elements in our soil. And some of the examples of some are iodine, selenium, which Christine Thompson's did a lot of work on, and fluoride. Okay, so those are quite low. And that's important to know because if we are getting low levels of these in our soils, there may be low levels in our diet, in our foods, and there may be some adverse health consequences that we have to check and make sure um, that we address in, in a population, particularly at a government level. 
So the typical, and I use that in brackets, the typical New Zealand diet, okay, historically, I, had, I say is, probably should say was low in iodine, okay? Historically, it was low in iodine. The foods that are the richest source of iodine are foods from the ocean, seaweed. New Zealanders don't eat much seaweed, okay? Fish and shellfish, and we do eat those, but not enough of those, and probably infrequently, often particularly fish due to cost. Other foods that are moderate sources of iodine are dairy products and eggs, and poor sources of iodine are your vegetables and fruits, okay? So just to keep that in mind. Okay, so a little bit about the history of iodine in New Zealand. So it's not a super technical slide, but I'm just going to go through this. So I don't know if you probably may not remember, but it is difficult to do a blood test to work out whether you're mildly iodine deficient or even moderately iodine deficient. For some nutrients, we can just do a blood test. You know, vitamin D is not too bad, and, and iron is pretty good. But for iodine and some other things like um, sodium, we can't just do a blood test. It's not that easy. For those kind of nutrients, potassium, iodine, um, uh, sodium, what we do is we measure the amount of iodine that's excreted in the urine. About 90% of what you eat gets excreted into the urine, okay? So that's a good indirect way of working out how much iodine is in the diet, okay? So what you can see here from this figure is um, in the early 1900s, we were well below, our level of iodine in our urine was well below that red line, okay? Now that red line is where we want to be. And I always say to the students, it's such an easy number to remember because it's 100, Okay, we want to be above 100 micrograms per liter. And what you can see is that we are quite low back in the 1900s. And that was work that was done by people at the University of Otago in the medical school. So they did some, some work on that. And that was happening around the world. In 1939, um, the government introduced iodized salt. Now, that iodized salt that they introduced was really for use at the table and in cooking. Okay? The iodized salt could have been used in kind of processed foods like tin tomatoes and things like that, but it wasn't. It was just used really at the table, so at, at home by women or men who were cooking, and not used in other food products. So just keep that in mind. But what it was introduced in 1939 in New Zealand at a level of about 50 parts per, billion, per million, by the 1950s, the number of people who had goiter, which was about maybe uh, somewhere between 10 and 30 percent, dropped down to less than 1% by the 1950s. So it was very effective, OK? Um, and then in the 1960s, in the 1960s, we had another increase in iodine coming into the diet. And that's because I'm sure you know that iodine is a disinfectant. OK, you can put it on your skin and disinfectant. But so what happened is the dairy industry started using an iodine-containing solution as a disinfectant. And that contaminated, now that sounds very not good, but in fact, it was a good thing. Um, that contaminated milk products, and as a result, the amount of iodine went up in milk products, okay? So we got two sources during that time of iodine coming into our diet. We had from the iodized salt and from our milk products, okay? So we were, went from deficiency to sufficiency. But then something happened. We went down to deficiency again. And how did, the, how did we find out about this? Well, Professor Christine Thompson, was doing a study looking at selenium, and she decided that she'd measure the amount of iodine in the urine samples that they'd done, and she found that they were low. And that was the beginning of a whole a lot of research which involved me, um, Professor Gibson, as well as others in the department, looking at the iodine status of um, New Zealanders from the 1990s onward. So I put this pic picture back up. Okay, so now we're kind of around 1996. Okay, so just to keep that in mind, that's when I started my PhD. So my PhD was, as Richard said, titled The Iodine Status of Vulnerable Groups of the Population. I looked at a very small study of pregnant women and their newborn infants, um, at uh, toddlers, and then at, at, ch at children. And the children's study looked at the iodine status of children living in Dunedin and Wellington, and we found about 1 in 10 children had goiter at that time. Okay, 
So this was work, this, my two supervisors, marvelous supervisors were Professor Christine Thompson and Professor Rosalind Gibson, and I'm very um, thankful that I had, uh, had a, a great supervision and I was able to finish. I did it part-time while working part-time. Uh, it did take some time, they were very patient. So when I graduated in 2004, continued to do with colleagues studies. And so I'm just gonna talk to you about a few little studies that we did um, that are particularly, I think they were quite fun. I really like these fun studies. So one of them was this study. This was done in kind of 2005, 2006. We have Amy Pettigrew-Porter there with the, the pink top. She was a dietitian who came back to do a master's of science. And beside her is Stephanie, she's an ultrasonographer. And we got this van called the Thyromobile, which I think is a really cool name, okay? And then we had to come up with this kind of acronym, and so we came up with the TRIP study, because basically we took the Thyromobile, and Amy drove it all the way from Auckland all the way down to Dunedin, okay? The Thyromobile is equipped with a fridge, so we can store uh, a blood sample, a little small blood sample, and a urine sample, and ultra also has an ultrasound um, machine in it, so that we were able to sort of assess the iodine status. Uh, in this case, we looked at iodine status of pregnant women all the way down the country. It wasn't a big study, but it was a, a quite a fun study. And you'll note, it's hard to tell, that they're in front of two big piles of salt. Okay, so again, yeah. Just keep that in mind. So um, this is the paper. It took some time to publish, but this is the paper that was finally published. And it says, are pregnant women in New Zealand iodine deficient? And yes, they were. They were all iodine deficient. So let's just keep that in mind. Now, um, in 2002, the government did a National Children's Nutrition Survey, and iodine was included in this survey. And this uh, survey found pretty much what we had found in a smaller study as part of, our, uh, part of my PhD. But this was a survey of children um, from much, many more places throughout New Zealand than just the study that I did, which was just Dunedin and Wellington. Saying that, found exactly the same thing, okay? So here, what you can see, well, a bit hard to see, is they again, on the y-axis, we've got the urinary iodine concentration. It's in micrograms per deciliter. That's why it says 7.5 and 7 and 6.5. So if you multiply by 10, you'll get it back up to those other numbers we were talking about. And where we want to be is 10 micrograms. So that would be at the top of the slide. Okay, and what you can see here is regardless of whether we group the children either by age, okay, or by ethnicity, all the children had mild iodine deficiency. Okay, so that was kind of confirmation that mild iodine deficiency had reemerged in New Zealand. Then in 2008 and 2009, okay, there was another nutrition survey. This was called the Adult Nutrition Survey. And in adults 15 years and over, again, just look at what's in the boxes. You can see that we're at 55. This time it's in micrograms per liter. And 50, and what this is showing is, again, that New Zealand adults across the country were also iodine deficient. We pretty much confirmed, I'm sure I've convinced you, that iodine deficiency was prevalent throughout the, throughout the country. So we've gone from deficiency to sufficiency to deficiency, but why? Why did this happen? Why did we have a reemergence of mild iodine deficiency? Well, there's a few things. First of all, remember that I said that this iodized salt wasn't really used in any processed food products. Okay, and so probably what happened between the early 1900s up until the kind of 1990s and beyond is that people started um, using or eating a lot more processed food, okay, because people were making less food in the home. And as a result, because a lot of that processed food at the time contained non-iodized salt, that was a bit of a drop. The other thing is, of course, more people were using this pink Himalayan salt, which doesn't contain or contains negligible amounts of iodine. <laughs> Uh, another thing was the dairy industry stopped using those iodine-containing disinfectants, so that dropped the iodine um, in the dairy products. And then finally, of course, we have our quite a few public um, health physicians in the room who said that we needed to use less salt because of its link with hypertension and stroke. So we think that kind of combination of factors resulted in the reemergence of iodine deficiency in the 1990s. Okay, so. I've convinced you, as I said, that we had iodine deficiency mild in every group studied in New Zealand. Now, I just want to make sure you're very clear that we've never seen cretinism in New Zealand, 
Okay, so we know we don't have severe iodine deficiency. We've never had a problem with cretinism. So we're looking more along that edge. Okay, so what? You have a little bit of too, too little iodine in urine. Does that actually mean anything? So the next kind of phase of, of, of research was to look at the implications of not getting enough iodine in your diet. What are the implications? What are the effects, particularly on the brain? So one of the studies that we did, again, I'm just picking a couple of key interesting studies, is called th something called the THINK project. The THINK project was the second randomized control trial uh, that I undertook, and I really love randomized control trials. They're one of my favorite kinds of uh, research designs. And in this randomized control trial, we had two master's students, uh, Meredith Petty and Rosie Gordon, and then we also uh, used Ted Ruffman from psychology to give us some help with picking out these kind of tests that we we're going to use. And we, we recruited children living in Dunedin North Intermediate and at Balmacuan Intermediate. And I was pretty sure they were all iodine deficient, and they were, okay, as a group. And then what we do in a randomized controlled trial is we randomly put half into a placebo group and half into a uh, treatment group. And so these children were given and that's why I got my props, these um, pills, okay? And I can tell you, you won't be able to tell the difference between the placebo pills or the, or the iodine pills because that's the whole point of a randomized controlled trial. So in this study, we recruited the children into the study. We, I should say Rosie and, and uh, Meredith did most, most, if not all of the work. And um, we took a urine sample from the children. They did a fingerprint blood sample. And then with Ted's advice, we looked at uh, four different kind of tests of cognition. And those tests of cognition are part of the IQ, uh, developed or working out children's IQ, but we did not do the full range, so we cannot make any comments about IQ. And I just thought I'd talk about one study, probably Harley, you're very familiar with these um, tests. One of them is called picture concepts. So here is, this is our brochure for trying to recruit the children. And this is one of the tests. So in picture concepts, you have rows of pictures. And then the children have to match a picture in the bottom row with a picture in the top row by concept. So it's relatively straightforward. I think this one I find easy. Okay, as they go along, they're actually quite difficult, and I couldn't do them, even though they're four children. So this one is easy. This is, this is a torch and a lamp. Okay, So that's just an example of some of the kind of tests that we did. So what did we find? So we did four, only four tests because Ted thought that they would be the best test to respond to um, an increase in iodine. And this is what you can see here is the children did better on all of the tests, okay, because they're all on the uh, right-hand side, particularly better in picture concepts and matrix reasoning. And when you put all the tests together, Okay, we get an overall improvement in cognitive score. So this tells us that giving mildly iodine deficient uh, children a little bit of extra iodine that did seem to, in the short term, improve their uh, cognition. And we wrote this up uh, in the American Journal of Clinical Nutrition, and it's been viewed as sort of a landmark study. So that's interesting. But of course, we didn't follow the children. We don't know what happened to them after they stopped, and that is unfortunately one of the kind of downsides about I wish we had, had continued to follow them. It would have been interesting to see. Of course, when does the brain develop the most? In pregnancy. Okay? So if we're seeing some sort of effect in intermediate age children, it would be, I thought it would be very good to do a randomized controlled trial in pregnant women. And I really wanted to do a randomized controlled trial in pregnant women. And this is from the Thyroid Foundation of Australia. It says, get smart, protect your baby's brain. And remember I said with the thyromobile study, most uh, pregnant women that we had measured had quite low iodine cities. So I was you know, interested to look at that. Um, it was difficult at that time to get enough funds. We got a little bit of money from the University of Otago, but not enough to do the trial here. We went to India, we tried to do the trial there, but we didn't get ethical approval. I managed to, uh, to work with some people in Adelaide, Maria McCready's and Joe Zhu, and they got some money from NHMRC to do a randomized control trial, but when we were just about to start that study, 
we also lost the ability to continue. Because you can see that ethically, maybe it's a little bit tricky to do this kind of study. And in fact, that has been a problem around the world to get approval to do a randomized controlled trial, giving women placebo, which has got no iodine, and a, and a treatment group. So even though we'd got this money from the Australian government, we couldn't do an RCT, but we turned that into a cohort study. And so this was just finally published. It's a long time we recruited, I think, seven or 800 pregnant women and followed them through uh, up, up until their children were 18 months. And so this paper has finally been published uh, and looks at the association, so I underline that, between maternal iodine intake and pregnancy and child neurodevelopment at 18 months. And this is a figure, I thought this was the sort of simplest figure to put up, that is from the supplementary uh, information for this particular paper. And so what you can see here is we have the cognitive composite score, which is on the y-axis, and along the x-axis, we have pregnancy iodine intake. And what I want you to see is it is so common with lots of nutrients that we have a sweet spot right in the middle. So somewhere between 200 to 400 micrograms of iodine, we have the highest cognitive score. If you have too much iodine, the cognitive score, that means it's worse. And if you have too little, it's worse. Okay? So there's been a couple of these cohort studies that have shown this same kind of relationship. But we can't really be definitive until we do a randomized control trial. So I just want to make sure that we're clear about that. And they are doing such a trial now in Sweden. And they've tried many times to get money to do it in the UK. But I'm not sure how far that's gone. I've reviewed a lot of grants from the UK suggesting we do that. OK, so this is an article that was published by 3 News in 2009. So I'm just trying to think about going back to 2009. I did not suggest the title of that article. <laughs> Iodine Deficiency Dumbing Down a Generation of New Zealand Children. So I don't know if I should say this. But between the early 1990s up until 2009, we had some problems with iodine uh, in the New Zealand diet. And I often say to the students, OK, and I say, when were you born? <laughs> But we know lots of things affect cognition than just one nutrient. So uh, family dynamics, genetics, environment, schooling, lots of things. OK, so 2009 is an uh, important year because a lot of the work that we had done with colleagues in the Department of Human Nutrition finally came to fruition. And in 2009, the bakers were told that they needed to put iodized salt in bread. OK, so that, why do we pick something like bread? Because it's a staple food. Salt is a staple food. Most people eat bread. Most people used to eat bread, OK? But at the time, most people ate bread, OK? And it looked like it was a good food um, to add some iodized salt to, because lots of people would then, like children and adults and elderly, would all increase their iodine intake. Saying that, the World Health Organization does recommend that iodized salt is put into every processed food. Okay? But New Zealand took a more conservative approach and decided just to put it into bread. Okay? So just sort of keep that in mind. So I guess the question is, okay, has it worked? Okay? So after 2009, I've been involved again with colleagues uh, and a number of students looking at the effect of uh, increased iodine coming for bread in particular, uh, what we call post-fortification. OK, so there's a picture of Briar. She's at one of the schools up in Auckland collecting a urine sample. You know, they don't really want to do it, but then they kind of get into it after a while, um, <laughs> understandably. She's smiling there. And this is taken from the paper, so it's not a great uh, uh, reproduction. But what I want to point out to you is if we look at the median urinary iodine concentration, OK, what you can see is in the Children's Nutrition Survey, it was 68. Then in the small study we did in 2011, it was 113. And then in the study that Breyer was involved in, which is this study, it was 116. And we want to be above 100. So it has seemed to work. And there's been other studies done by myself, other people from around uh, New Zealand, as well as by the Ministry of Primary Industries, showing that there has been an improvement in iodine status. It's not perfect, but it has worked. And it's just sort of above that. So we've gone from deficiency to sufficiency to deficiency back up to sufficiency. So 
Research over. Career finished. <laughs> What's next for iodine? Well, how much added salt do we actually use? Do we actually need iodized salt anymore? Okay, so this is something we've got. There she is, right in the middle. Uh, and Sing Wang from Singapore has just arrived, and she's going to be using a method to uh, look at added salt, both um, at the table and in cooking. And that will tell us whether we, with Rachel McLean, whether we, how much sodium we're getting from that salt and how much iodine we're getting. And also, because I've spent a lot of time collecting urine samples and working with children in particular, I have, and of course iodine is you know, continuing down, and we've had a success story with iodine. I've now moved into fluoride or fluorine, okay? Yeah, and that's been interesting because that kind of ties into a little bit about nutrition misinformation, no surprise, and food literacy, which I'll talk about more. Okay, so here we go. Now here I have that little green, okay? That little green, and it's purposeful that it's green, okay? Because this is getting into sustainability and nutrition and sustainable diets. Now, to be honest, I have to be honest because you've got family members here and you know, you just can't, you know. I'm not the most sustainable person, okay? I, I do try, I do try. Uh, and they do, they do have to take a lot of flack from me about things. And poor Bailey had to take a lot of flack because I said, look, they're ordering these things afterwards. I said, we don't want any food waste, okay? We can't have any food waste, so let's not order as much, okay? And she said, people will eat everything, so you must eat everything. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to talk very briefly about sustainability, okay, in four different topic areas, and then, then I'll, be, I'll be finished. So first of all, I want to talk about work um, at the University of Otago, work in the food supply chain with primary school children, and then finally with parents. So at the University of Otago. So I can see Carrie, he's up there. And this is really work that was initiated by Carrie Shepard in HEDC. And he got a very multidisciplinary group of people together to look at the graduate attributes that we have at the University of Otago. And one of those attributes is environmental literacy, okay? And this is defined as a basic understanding of the principles that govern natural systems, the effects of human activity on these systems, and the cultures and economies that interact with those systems. So I, I was very interested in environmental literacy. We did a number of different studies collaboratively with people from tourism, from surveying, from marketing, from food science, from, oh, math and stats, zoology, a whole range of different, uh, different areas. And we, Carrie was very much overseeing that, looking at whether there was a change in students in environmental literacy over the time they were at university. I was particularly interested in human nutrition students in that link with sustainable diets. And we I introduced a module teaching sustainable nutrition and aspects about sustainable diets to nutrition students, and then we evaluated that. And I can see Sarah Marie's up at the back, and Sarah Marie Innes, who also has a degree in psychology and human nutrition, wrote up a fabulous paper called Greeting the Curriculum to Foster Environmental Literacy in Tertiary Students Studying Human Nutrition. And uh, this was, a, I think, you know, it just kind of shows you that hopefully, by coming to university, students do learn some things, possibly take away some of this, and that may change behavior when they leave. So that's one aspect. Just want to talk about briefly, we've written lots of other different papers, uh, which Carrie has overseen. The next area is the food supply chain. So the person who's really uh, kind of tagged on is Miranda. So Miranda's right in front of me, associate professor from food science, and it's mostly been doing stuff on food waste. And Miranda is the expert. I've just kind of tagged on there uh, um, with more, more recently. Miranda has been involved in this National Food Waste Prevention Product uh, Project, which is a partnership between the Waste Men's Behavior Change Sector Group and the University of Otago. Okay, and so what the project is doing is aiming to quantify food waste. So I'm sure most of you know that about 30% of food is wasted globally, okay? And it's interesting to know where that's happening along the food supply chain. There's been a number of projects um, that have taken part. Um, household food waste has been done. That was done in 2013, and some of you may have seen those infographics. Um, cafe and restaurant food waste was done in 2018. 
And supermarket food waste is where I sort of got involved, particularly with uh, a student that we co-supervised, uh, Francesca Goodman-Smith. So here is a picture, okay? It's a great picture. Now, unfortunately, we can't see Miranda because Miranda is the one who took the picture. We did have a ball that afternoon uh, measuring all this rotten, not too rotten, vegetables and trying to work it out and stuff. It was quite good fun. Uh, that was just the pilot. And then Francesca went uh, across New Zealand and measured the amount of food that was wasted. It's a fairly small study, amount of food that was wasted um, uh, at different supermarkets around New Zealand. And what did she find? Well, I can tell you right now that pigs in New Zealand are very well fed. So just to let you know, that's where a lot, about 50% of the retail supermarket food waste is going to the pig farmer. But what about the quantity? Okay, so the total food waste per, atom, per annum, these are just estimates, okay, for at the supermarket is about 14,000 tons and household is 122,500 tons. So a lot more at the household. People really are very tough on supermarkets, okay? And if we look at that per capita, again, it's a rough estimate. It's about three kilograms per person per year, okay? Compared to 10 times more. So most of the waste is happening at the home, okay? Supermarkets, let's, let's not be too hard because when they throw away food, they're throwing away money. So this has been written up, and we haven't heard yet, have we, Miranda? We've been waiting a really long time um, for this. We're, um, fingers crossed, right? Probably shouldn't put it up there, but anyways, I'll put it up there. Okay. <laughs> it's under review. It's gone through. I think it'll be fine. Food waste through the supply chain. So Francesca produced this um, diagram, and we've looked at the distribution and retail in her study, and now the next step is we're going to look at post-harvest or crop loss. Okay, so this, we've got another study student that we're co-supervising and she's going to be looking, doing a little kind of a trial of methods in December, uh, looking at tomatoes, okay, and then she'll be looking and measuring that in New Zealand uh, in next year. So that's kind of the next step. So that's food supply in the chain. What about primary school children? So primary school children is an interesting area. Having worked in nutrition for 20 years, and you can kind of glean this from what I've been saying, um, yes, there's a lot of nutrition misinformation, and sometimes it is a challenge um, to, hmm, I don't want to say if I want to use the word convince, to um, change adults' perception about foods and diets. Okay, it's hard to change behavior. Caroline, you're doing that course. Maybe you've got more success, hopefully, at changing people's behavior, but it is difficult, okay? People have particular ideas, and it is difficult to, um, to sort of inform people about the science. So I was thinking about that kind of got a bit discouraging after 10, 20 years working in nutrition to think that, you know, as, as much as I know or anyone knows uh, in this room about nutrition, that people are not always uh, perhaps all that receptive. So my thought was perhaps we need to go back, okay? We've, adults are fine. They can continue on. Let's go to school children. Let's work within the school system. So that led to some work looking at food literacy. So food literacy... Where's Lara? There she is, food Lara's. Um, is the knowledge, skills, attitudes, and behaviors that are needed to have a diet that is environmentally sustainable and conducive to health. So food literacy is knowing something about food, how it's grown, uh, what's in it, how to use it, so that you can have a healthy diet and make choices, okay? But also it does have an environmental aspect, so it kind of covers everything. And obviously, if we improve food literacy, particularly in anybody, okay, because I, I would say that on the whole, a lot of people in the public are not particularly food literate, but if we can improve food literacy across the scope, but particularly in school children, improve food choices, that should improve health. So, but how do you measure food literacy? So we've come up with a very, um, I would say, a little bit of a rough tool. It's a survey that was designed by Teresa O'Sullivan in 19, 19, in 20, 2014. And what this involves is an online questionnaire, okay, for a nine to 11 year old children. And it has uh, three different sections. The first section's on food origins. So how food is grown, it's a bunch of multiple choice questions, but often with pictures, so it's quite child friendly. 
And it asks questions, the first section asks questions about how food is grown, seasonality, that kind of thing. The next session is on, section is on nutrition knowledge. So, you know, how many servings do we need of different foods, about nutrients, things like that, which is typically what we used to assess, not so broad. And then the last section is on food skills, like, you know, how do we store food, how do we cook food, that kind of thing, okay? And this questionnaire, here's an example, this is from Lara, who is an MSc student who worked on this project, uh, is one example of uh, a question that the, student, that the children would have to answer. So I'm hoping, probably shouldn't have put the little ticks up, yeah. I'm hoping that you all really could answer that question. Select all the foods that count towards your five plus a day. Canned peaches and apple frozen peas, not hot chips and not raisins. Okay? And there's a series of questions like that. So we have used this food literacy questionnaire, okay, to, and Lara, it was Lara's the one who did it with uh, four masters of dietetic students, to actually get a baseline value for uh, food literacy in New Zealand children living in Auckland, Wellington, and Christchurch. And their mean score, and this was, work, was done with Murray, uh, is 68%, so 68 out of 100. They did slightly better in food origins, a uh, little worse in the nutrition knowledge, and then they did okay in the food skills. This gives us a baseline because now we want to go out, or I'd like to go out, and use this online... Um, Food, uh, online food literacy questionnaire to assess the impact or the improvement in food literacy in school children where they're introducing school garden programs. And I'm currently working with the Garden to Table Trust, which is a registered charity that is um, um, about establishing school gardens at schools. And then we're going to use that particular tool to measure their food literacy before and after the introduction of the uh, Garden to Table, where they do a kind of a garden and then they they grow things, and they, uh, they harvest it, and they cook it, and then they eat it together. So hopefully, we can see an improvement. And that the whole point of doing that is so that uh, the Garden to Table Trust can hopefully, and the gov it will, in will inform the, um, the government, the Ministry of Education, to put some money here into this area. Because right now, there's not a lot of money going into this aspect of education. So finally, just about finished, the last bit, parents. So this is very new. Where's Anne Louise? Oh, there she's up there. Um, she knows, she must know this is coming. So Anne Louise Heath, okay, this is with Anne Louise, got a HRC grant earlier this year looking at baby lead weaning. One aspect of that um, application that's got a lot of attention is baby food pouches. And thank you, Anne Louise. Somebody must have brought these because I couldn't find them on us. So we've got these baby food pouches. Have you seen these before? Okay. So... The baby food pouches are interesting. And Miranda and myself and Anne Louise, we have, where is Maddie? I saw her. No, somewhere, I'm not sure. Oh, there you are. OK, there's Maddie there. Uh, we've got someone who's going to be looking at the baby food pouches. Initially, we're just interested in the kind of sustainability of this kind of single-use packaging. OK, but you can see for parents, OK, that the only organic is a little, Oh, it's good that I got the same ones. That's good. Uh, the only organic, it's kind of a bit of a, a, a you know, it looks like it'll be super healthy, but then we've got the packaging and everything. So we're going to be looking at that. So it's kind of an interesting area. And these, I went to the supermarket, as I said yesterday, and at Fresh Choice, I would say probably, I don't know, most of the shelves were these. This is how most of the foods are being sold, OK? And this is relevant, particularly for my little grandson, Gabriel. I know he's cute. This is at Allen's B. I had to put him up there. He's so gorgeous. And so that kind of ends my talk, but not before I say something which is about what I'm wearing, OK? So, you know, when you, you give me, oh, I know, it's a feminine thing, you know, what should I wear? Should I buy a new dress? And my daughters would say no. But in fact, earlier this year, they gave me this beautiful jersey, okay? And this jersey is all about single use. Can you see the pattern? Single use plastics and its effect on the environment. So I really thought it was a perfect thing to wear today, okay? So that is the end. I've gone from 1989 all the way through to 2019. I think I've probably gone over my 45 minutes. And I just wanted to have a couple of last slides uh, of people who I particularly like to thank. Hopefully you see yourselves in there. Uh, supervisors, colleagues who have helped me uh, and supported me in particular for various different ways throughout uh, the last 30 years. 
The person who's probably helped me the most is my husband, Murray. That's why he gets the biggest picture. Because <laughs> um, he's really been right from the beginning to the end. Okay, So he's helped me tr tremendously. Uh, and maybe you could also have a look at the slide. Okay, if you'd like to see that, for those of you who are not sure whether you should replace butter with uh, polyunsaturated vegetable oils, uh, just have a look at that slide and maybe talk to him later. Um, there's also so many other people that I like to thank, and of course, when you're doing this, you, you walk by. Today, I walked by, oh my God, I forgot them. Oh, I forgot them. So I've got a whole range of other staff. Kate Burrard, who's read so many of my grants, teaching fellows, which could fill the whole page, Clinton, um, st statisticians, uh, technical staff, administrative staff, and then at the end, I've got Megan, Marie, and Pam. Those are the cleaners. You know what? I don't even know their last names. And I thought, that is not good. But anyways, they, they have been there, and they're always there at night. My international collaborators, OK, from both Australia, New Zealand, and abroad. And finally, the best for last. Everybody, I don't have everybody here, and I don't have all the students here. But really, it's all for the students. I love working with students. Thank you. Kia ora. My, my name is Janice Murray. I'm the Deputy Pro Vice Chancellor for the Division of Sciences. And it is my distinct pleasure to say thank you to Sheila for a fascinating and informative talk that she's presented to us today. Sheila, I think it's, uh, as I was sitting there, I was reminded of the value of these professorial lectures. And they remind us each and every time, I think, of the significant contribution that our top researchers at the university uh, make to not only their own field and the area of which within which they're working in the university, but to the, to the greater community and to the benefit of, of all. And your work on iodine and your now work on sustainability is a testament to that contribution that many of our researchers do make at the university. So thank you very much for that. I also promised Sheila I'd be very short on the thanks because it's important that we have opportunity to uh, retreat to the staff club at the university where we, I would invite you all to come and uh, have a little bit of refreshment and plenty of conversation with Sheila. She stole my line. I was going to say things like, I'm sure there's iodine in the salt over there. And we will do our utmost to eat every nibble that's being provided so as to minimize any food wastage uh, whatsoever. Uh, what remains for me is to present you, Sheila, with a small token of appreciation of the university. Uh, this is to thank you and recognize your significant promotion to professor. It's well-deserved, as Harleen indicated, and all the best. Thank you.